Thank you. Thanks a lot to the organizers. And um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be speaking at IMPA. I'm going to talk about something that is uh, very general and, and apparently doesn't have much to do with uh, what has been uh, spoken about before, even in the talks of the day. Um, but since it is very general and very soft, um, it has something to do with beyond uniform hyperbolicity. I even put some pictures in there to just prove that I somehow belong to this conference, mm -hmm. to this semester. Anyway, um, and I also want to apologize because the talk will be utterly untechnical. I mean, there's going to be a bunch of ideas that you won't see a, a, a hard theorem for a long time. You will see a bunch of ideas and concepts. And I decided to design the talk this way because I think actually the concepts in this business are more important than the theorems, which will come if you're patient enough. I mean, the, the last slides, there are going to be some results, and some of them are uh, serious results in terms of mathematics. Anyway, the talk concerns the uh, definition of mixing in infinite ergodic theory. This is the definition of the ordinary definition of mixing that we all know and appreciate. Um, cast in two forms, the one with the sets, the actual mixing of sets, which is the first one, and uh, the definition of mixing using functions, which I will call observables in this talk. Um, so yeah, the mixing has to do, sorry, yeah, okay, has to do with the mixing of two sets, two sets specifically the evolution of one set, in this case it's the back evolution, but it really doesn't matter. Um, how much of the evolution of one set is in the other set that has to be proportional to the measure of the starting set A with respect to the, to the proportion of, of the uh, entire space. Um, this can be recast, like I said, in terms of, of um, observables, but if you actually recast it in terms of observables and you start calling this decay of correlation, it's because that's what it is. If you put a minus sign here, this is the correlation between the two observables or to random variables, if you wish, the evolution of f and g. Well, if you recast it that way, it is apparent that you have a problem if you want to transport this definition to the infinite measure setting. So suppose you have an infinite measure preserving map. You know, this is an interesting, intrinsically probabilistic notion. What do you do with that? This is a long-standing problem, actually. The, the first mention that I um, saw of this is in the famous book by Hopf in 1937, uh, famous book in ergodic theory. And he doesn't actually care about giving a theory or anything at like this, but it's some section, I believe it's section 15 of the book. Uh, he considers one example here. And by the way, uh, my notation, what is in green, can also be skipped if you, know, you don't want to read the whole thing. I mean, if you want to skip something, skip the green part. Um, because here, it's not really important what the, what the system is. There is one system. It's a subset of R2 with the Lebesgue measure, uh, infinite, uh, of infinite measure, for which he proves this quantity. I mean, you can imagine that in most sets that you can think of, if you have, let's go back to the interpretation of the, two, of the mixing of the two sets. If you have a set B and a set A and you start evolving or back evolving the set A, since there is infinite room, the back evolution of the set A will go more or less throughout the phase space, I mean, will invade everything. So the portion of that set inside B is going to go to zero. So the previous definition, the ordinary definition, wouldn't work because you would expect it to go to zero in most cases. But then he says, well, there are some examples in which you actually you can control how it goes to zero. You have here this sequence, this increasing sequence, which is the same pretty much for every set. Now, he didn't really prove it for every set. He proved it for all sets that he calls squareable, so sets whose frontier, whose boundary has, um, has measure zero. And so he finishes the section by saying, here's an example of a mixing system in infinite ergodic theory without providing a theory or even defining what mixing is. I mean, he says he calls it mixing. Anyway. Uh, yeah, then not much uh, has been done in the, uh, you know, in the next 30 years. Um, we come to 1967 when Krickeberg actually uh, turns Hobbes' definition into Hobbes' um, example into a definition. I mean, once again, there are, I'm really getting confused with this. There are conditions here. You, you have, you take M, which is a topological space, completely regular and blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, you, you take a sigma finite measure on it, which you call mu. And then, if you can find this number, which we'll eventually call scaling rate, this sequence, for every pair of sets 
Once again, for every pair of squareable sets, actually, nowadays there is a theorem that tells you you cannot do, you can't do more than that. I mean, you can always find sets that destroy this property. So you have to restrict to special sets, to sets that are not really too pathological. So you take squareable sets. So if you can find this sequence, which we now call scaling rate, for which this happens um, for every pair of squareable sets, then you call the system mixing. So that's his proposal for a definition of uh, mixing in infinite ergodic theory, which, by the way, in short, we call infinite mixing. So, so what is good and bad about this definition? What is good is that it's a very natural definition. It's been used by many people. Some of them are in, the, in this room. Um, because it's, the, it's the, the natural idea, if you know that that intersection has measure that goes to zero, you want to know how it goes to zero. So if you rescale properly, you know, does the mixing, the mixing occurs in the set B? So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, by the way, some of these people actually used, for instance, Izzo is one of them, used this definition without even knowing that there was a definition actually before. So it really comes natural. So that's the good part. The bad part is that, you know, this is infinite ergodic theory and the, the guy requires a topological structure. You have um, the, the map, actually, I didn't quite mention that, it was written before was an uh, almost everywhere homeomorphism, which means um, continuous function almost everywhere with an inverse that is continuous also almost everywhere. And also, you need to talk about squareable sets, so you need to have an apology there. So one might not like that. I'm, I, pers I personally don't dislike it. I don't think it's so bad. But still, somehow it goes beyond ergodic theory. And what's really bad, actually, in my opinion at least, is that this definition only sees finite measure sets, something that focuses on what happens locally, whereas you have an infinite measure space to be uh, considered. Anyway, so other two people actually came along with, that proposed other definitions, Krangel and Suchstone. Um, actually, they proposed two definitions. Once again, you can actually forget about this thing. I mean. Uh, these are the two definitions. They call it mixing and completely mixing. If you take any set, and then the difference between mixing and completely mixing uh, actually lies there, what you mean by any set. In one case, it's any finite measure set. In the other case, it's any measurable set. Um, you take the sequence of its backward images, uh, the, yes. And if that sequence is semi-remotely trivial, you have the definition here, but it's really not very important. Then you call the system mixing in one case, or completely mixing in the other case. So what is the reason behind this strange definition? The reason is that if you recast the definition of mixing in finite ergodic theory, uh, that way, I mean, it, this is actually, I mean, first of all, they're, in finite ergodic theory, they're, they're all equivalent because these conditions are the same. So yeah, one of the two authors actually found out that the definition of, classical definition of mixing can be recast that way. So, if you just copy that definition into infinite ergodic theory, everything makes sense. So at least formally, I mean, these are well-posed definitions. Now, the question is, are they useful or not? What is sigma in the trivial? This is the sigma algebra generated by that sequence. So remotely trivial means if you have a sequence of sets, remotely trivial means the tail sigma algebra generated by the sequence of sets is trivial. Same remotely trivial means there is a sequence, a subsequence of the sequence of set who, trivial, who's remotely trivial. Anyway, um, the good part is, well, they started with this purpose, with this aim, is that these definitions only involve measure theory. Now, um, I don't know if you uh, caught the reference, the movie reference, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's not going to be any bad here. Everything goes directly to ugly. Because beyond that, and these are results that are in the same paper, so the, the two authors were completely aware of that. The definition was given not just for measure and preserving dynamical systems, but, but for non-singular dynamical systems. If you specialize to measure preserving uh, maps, then their definition of mixing, the first definition, is the same as zero type in the language of uh, Ajahn and Kakutari, which means that. And that is, you know, somehow captures what we were saying before, but without even a scaling rate or anything like this. So this is really a very, very weak definition. For instance, translations in RD would be mixing with this definition. It's just a, you just want that, you know, the evolution of one set eventually escapes the other set. So this is really very weak. What about complete mixing? Well, they also proved in the same paper that if you have an invertible measure preserving dynamical system, the 
property of complete mixing as I define it, well, I, I wrote not possible because I thought actually that I had written somewhere that the system has to be ergodic. But let's say this is not compatible with ergodicity because they prove that if you are complete mixing, if an invertible measure preserving dynamical system is complete mixing, completely mixing, then there exists a, a probability measure which is absolutely continuous with your invariant measure, which is invariant in mixing. So if this mu is also ergodic, then you know, they have to be singular, you know, relatively singular to each other, so that cannot happen. So mixing is too weak, and then complete mixing is really too strong for most systems that we want to talk about. So what? You, uh, you assume, um, actually recurrence, I don't remember me. I forgot to mention ergodic and pretty, I mean, pretty reasonably, actually, there, there was a, um, um, a thought, hypothesis of recurrence. In any case, let's say if you specialize to recurrent ergodic invertible measure preserving dynamical systems, you have that. You cannot have uh, complete mixing. Anyway, so what does the godfather of infinite ergodic theory have to say about that? In his book in 1990, he, uh, he writes that the discussion in Krangel and such stone indicates that there is no reasonable generalization of mixing. And my feeling about this was, well, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's, you know, they, they give reasonable definitions and then they destroy these definitions themselves. Uh, but what do you mean by reasonable? I mean, so, I mean, certainly there are systems that have this property of mixing stuff. I mean, you can imagine all these nice properties, you know, chaoticity, hyperbolicity, whatever you want, at play also in infinite measure preserving dynamical systems. You want to capture them. So there's got to be something. So, well, if reasonable by Aronson means a universal definition that is applied to Kur at every simple, at every case, well, then maybe I agree with him. Actually, I do agree with him. But what about letting go of a, a priori universal definition? Maybe you can have a bunch of definitions and also a bunch of definitions, a bunch of notions, let's say, that can be adapted you know, on a case-by-case -case basis to be made into precise definition only, pre precise definitions only when you have a dynamical system that is specific dynamical system and you know what you want to measure there. Another problem was actually that the previous, and this is um, you know, the main point of my talk, the main new concept actually, this definition, save for the KS complete mixing definition, involved either local observables or observables that are in L1 and in L2, or um, finite measure sets. So somehow this definition somehow captures only local properties of the system. And uh, you will see this in analogy with what I'm going to say next. I'm going to call these definitions local-local mixing. And I want to actually come up with observables or with functions that somehow see the system in its entirety, so see the system globally. And I want to call them global observables. So let's get a little more formal. Um, OK, I try to be as general as possible here. I mean, this is my dynamical system. This is just to lay out the notation. I consider either maps, I mean, uh, endomorphisms, automorphisms, or even um, flows. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I just think of T as a map, a measure-preserving map of a sigma finite measure space. Anyway, so I have in mind systems with, where the chaoticity or the mixing property, whatever that means, happens either everywhere or in localized parts of the phase space. So I'm going to call these two situations extended chaoticity or localized chaoticity. Uh, for instance, this is a system that I really like, so I spent uh, some time on it. Uh, it's a Lorentz gas, could be, in this case, it's a periodic Lorentz gas, so you have a flow on a three-dimensional phase space. The, uh, you have two dimensions for the position of a point and then one dimension for the velocity of the material point, it's because the speed of the point is conserved, so you just fix it equal to one. And this is um, the generative, if you wish, Hamiltonian system, so it preserves the Leville measure that everybody knows. In this case, at least most people in this room would know what it is. Um, another system that somehow is uh, um, like a, a toy model for that is this system here that is supposed to actually mimic a random walk. You start with a union of unit squares, and then in each unit square you have this sort of Baker's map. You have to think actually that these rectangles are stretched horizontally, 
every time actually to uh, make them equal to who's, you know, to stretch them to length one horizontally. So it's a Baker's map, I mean, but they don't, you know, these, map, these rectangles are not get mapped into itself, but to neighboring cells or even cells, I mean, second neighboring cells or anything like this. So uh, this is your phase space. I mean, um, I write ZD, but the picture is in Z2 here. If you know the actual position of a point on a square, then you know everything. So this is a deterministic dynamics. But supposed to actually, you only know where the, in what square your point lies, but you don't know what the position is, and you just make a guess that you know it's somewhere uh, distributed ar uh, according to the Lebesgue measure. Then, if you lose that information, you come from a deterministic system to a stochastic system, and that stochastic system is precisely the random walk. So you only know where it is, and then these probabilities. I mean, this is the length, the base length of this gives you the probability of going right, and this gives you the probability of going up, and so on and so forth. And since the map is piecewise linear and precisely Markov, I mean, with no distortion or anything like this, everything gets regenerated after a jump because the length goes up to one, the base length of the rectangle that gets mapped into, into another cell. And then you start again from here. You have probability here to go left, up, right, down, and so on. So if you decide to lose information, that is um, um, a representation of a random walk. Uh, another system would be an expanding map from R to R. In this case, I made it like 3 to 1. Um, if you choose these branches carefully, you can make it, for instance, Lebesgue invariant. And then, I mean, you can, you can have a um, Z invariant version of that, which I would call quasi-lift because, I mean, it's not exactly a lift of an uh, expanding map on the circle, but because you have this discontinuity, so it's a quasi-lift. And then this is the beyond uniform hyperbolicity uh, sort of tribute of my talk. Um, this is actually the ferry map, if you want to think of it, on the okay. so the ferry map is um, a well-known example of um, infinite measure preserving map of the interval. Now, if you map the interval into R plus, you map 0, which is the point at infinity here, into infinity. And you map 1 into 0. You do it with that conjugation there. You get that map over there, which, is, which has the good property that it actually, it actually preserves the Lebesgue measure. So I like to see the ferry map there, because the Lebesgue measure is more intu intuitive for me. Anyway, so these are examples that I have in mind. And so before explaining what, what I mean by global observable, um, I should actually recall or, or maybe introduce this concept from statistical mechanics, if you wish, or statistical physics, where, uh, from, from which many of the ideas and concepts of this talk are actually drawn. Suppose you have a set A, which you think uh, you know, goes throughout the phase space. I mean, it's a bunch of, I mean, here, it's confined here, but just imagine it goes throughout R2. And then suppose you ask yourself the question, what is the probability that a random point in the plane belongs in the set A? Then, of course, you're going to say that the question is ambiguous because you don't specify what you mean by random. And then the person will tell you, well, then I mean uniformly drawn random point. And they say, well, now the question is not ambiguous. It's just plainly wrong because the uniform measure on R2, the translation invariant measure on R2, which is the Lebesgue measure, is not a probability measure. So you can talk about randomness there. But then suppose you are a physicist or you took a class in statistical mechanics years ago. Then somebody in that, somewhere in that class, somebody must have told you that you solve problems like this by taking a box on your plane, and then you enlarge this box. And then for a very, very large box, everything works because you're not in an infinite measure space anymore. And then you say that the probability of hitting the, the, the set A Within the box, is, of course, is the measure of A within the box divided by the measure of the box, and then you take the limit. Of course, this is not a probability. Of course, everything here is riddled with mathematical problems. I mean, how do you choose the box? Does the limit exist all the time? And sure enough, there are problems like that. But that's the main idea. So uh, let's try to formulate this in, uh, in a more um, rigorous context. So. Um, once you're given a dynamical system, you introduce a class of measurable sets, which you want to think of 
as your uh, family of large boxes. You call these uh, italic V, and then a large box is called V. The only thing that you require is that every box in this set, every set in this family has finite measure, and then there exists at least an increasing sequence of such sets that exhausts the whole space, hence the name exhaustive family. Okay? But you can have more, and actually one of my points is going to be that you, know, you want to have more than one sequence that goes to infinity in many cases. Okay, then you call infinite volume limit, it, well, if, whatever you have here, if you have a function that depends on this V, you call it infinite volume limit, and you specify, and you mean uniformly, you know, with respect to the measure. Well, if you, if, you know, the limit that you get, if you have a limit, by taking larger and larger box, independently of the position of the box, but depending only on the measure of the box, so uniformly in the measure of the box, which is what this notation will try to convey. And if you have a limit in this sense, then you call it infinite volume limit. Okay, suppose, I mean, okay, let's go back to the examples that I uh, showed before. Uh, what are reasonable choices for these large boxes? For instance, in the Rollins gas, you can take a box in configuration space, so in position space, so two-dimensional thing, cross all the possible velocities. So that's a three-dimensional set in phase space. And then um, this, this uh, square have, has uh, side length 2R, and then you take R to go to infinity at some point. So that seems to be a reasonable family for this problem. Uh, or in the random walk case, you take uh, the square union, if you wish, of squares, of unit squares. And once again, you, know, you, let, you let K here is the index. You let K grow so that this, the union of this finite number of unit squares exhausts the whole phase space. In the case of the piecewise expanding map on R, you take uh, a centered uh, segment that, once again, gets larger and larger. Well, in the case of the ferry map, actually, somehow you only, you only have one way to go to infinity, so you take in, um, intervals of the type 0, R, and then you let R go to infinity. Okay, um, these are examples, and some of them are actually examples that are not very good, but there is a reason for me to actually put the wrong example first and then discuss it. So, there are some conditions that are both somehow physical, if you wish, convey some idea, and are also mathematical. Um, if V is to represent a large box, then you don't want a finite time evolution of V to be very different from V itself. Okay, this is a problem that is very common in statistical mechanics. I mean, if V is a, approximates the entire space, certainly the entire space is invariant, is dynamics invariant. If this is very far from being invariant, well, then you have a problem. I mean, first of all, you think that this choice of V would not be very good, and also we'll see you have mathematical problems. Suppose your infinite space space here is the plane, and then suppose I take you know, a large box like this, that grows all in one, in one direction, or at least grows in one direction much faster than it grows in the other direction. And then you apply the, dynamic for a, the dynamics for a finite time. So this is going to be, I don't know, change a little bit. This, this T and TV, the, the measure is going to be preserved. Of course, here, the change that you make by applying a finite time dynamics is very relevant. Not so for a box like this. Now, of course, which one would you choose to represent a large portion of the phase space? I would say this is probably a better choice than that. Okay, so the whole phase space must be, must be variant, and then something that represents it that you know, is thought to be large must be almost invariant at least. Okay, then let's, uh, let's come to the concept of global observable, which is sort of what I'm trying to introduce with this talk to discuss. Uh, a global observable is an L infinity function, so a bounded function, which somehow, I mean, which is the opposite of a local observable, meaning somehow measures things or sees things throughout the phase space. For instance, in the example of the random walk, let's say it's the most visual example maybe, a uh, local observable would be the displacement, the jump that you make every time. So that is zero nowhere. It's always one of the um, four uh, unit uh, vectors there for every, for every site, for every unit square. 
And you can imagine that the observable is important if you're thinking of uh, a random walk because the sum of these observables, if you wish, the co-cycle generated by um, that observable gives you the position, you know, in, uh, in phase space, gives the position of the random walker. And you can do the same with uh, the Lorentz gas. There are a bunch of observables that are not localized. They're somehow measured thing throughout the phase space. So this is not a definition. This is, this is just some ideas on how to choose your class of global observables that depends on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's a choice that you have to make. Only I require for things to actually work that this class that you choose is, comprises uh, bounded observables and that you have what you call an infinite volume average. If you remember, this is the infinite volume limit that I defined before. This is the integral over a large box, and this is the normalization over that large box. So you want to be talking about infinite volume average of your observable. Once again, this is not an axiomatic definition. I'm not defining global observables as the class of functions in L infinity for which this exists. I'm saying that you take a subclass of that, the one that you wish or the one that you can prove something about, but you should have at least these two conditions for stuff to make sense. The first thing that actually should make sense if you want to talk about mixing is that um, your functional, you don't want to call it a measure, this is I call it infinite volume average, but anyway, it's a function on the class of global observable. Well, you want the function to be, to be uh, dynamics invariant. And then this is why actually you needed a one. In, uh, from a mathematical point of view, a one was important for that, other than being physically relevant. And also, you, you also need these two conditions to make this work. So once you have this class, that once again, that it's up to you to choose on, uh, on any given case, so it's up to you to choose where you want to observe things and what things you want to observe, V and G. Well, you don't. But there's some something does work. I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's usually you actually do uh, Birkhoff sums using local observables, but you know certain things do work. You will see actually when we go through the definition of mixing. Actually, if you have those then um, convergence of Birkhoff sums actually will have to work will be uh, um, a consequence. So if you do have global observables, it seems like the, 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 the silliest or the easiest thing to do would be to couple them using this function you know, in lieu of your measure, and then you have the evolution of one global observable, the evolution of another global observable, and then you want them to uh, decorrelate in this way. So you say, OK, fine, this is my new definition of mixing might make sense, might not. Well, you start with mathematical problems which were related to what I was actually telling, before, telling you before. You know that these two objects exist because it's in the definition of global observables. But for instance, you don't even know whether the left-hand side of this equation exists, even before the limit, because the fact that the F as an infinite volume average and G as an infinite volume average doesn't imply, and also the evolution of F as an infinite volume average for that proposition that I showed before. But that in no way implies that the product of the two has an infinite volume average. So the left-hand side might not even exist. So how do you fix this? Well, you fix this by taking this. This is one way to fix this. It's my personal choice, actually. Um, you do a double limit, you know, as t goes to infinity, and as the large box exhausts, so it goes to infinity itself, I mean, exhausts the phase space. So. This is well defined. I, I need to define what this means. This means it's a joint limit. I mean, for means this. It's it's not really very hard. So for every epsilon that exists, let's say an M, it's a function of epsilon such that for every V with measure of V bigger than M, and for every T bigger than M the left-hand side minus the limit is less than epsilon. So they should, go, they should both go to infinity. Um, basically, driven by the same number, you could, even if you put constants in here, it doesn't really actually matter. So, anyway, this eliminates the ill-posedness, 
of the previous definition because this, is, this always exists, or if it doesn't exist, well, then if it doesn't exist, then the definition fails. And somehow captures some of the meaning of that anyway because it means that in very large boxes for very large times, you're very close to the uh, limit here or you're very close to this uh, number here, so you're almost uncorrelated, okay? These are two definitions of global gloom mixing. Now, let me discuss something about the choice of V, which was the class of large boxes, and G. Um, because there are problems, problems that, that are actually known in statistical physics and, and people know how to deal with in that field. But suppose you take your any, any um, transformation from the plane to the plane just because that's my favorite example, that is Lebesgue invariant, and mixing, I mean, you want it to be mixing. I mean, it's a transformation that you want to call mixing. For instance, it could be the random walk that I, that I mentioned before. You just glue all these um, unit squares together, then you have a perfectly good transformation of the plane into itself, save for finite measure sets of straight lines, which doesn't really matter. So, and you certainly want to call that transformation mixing because it mixes things up. I mean, it has hyperbolicity, it has everything. Anyway, and then come up with this observable. This is a global observable. Um, it's uh, in the gray part, it, it's one, and in the, uh, so in the right part is one, and in the yellow part, in, in the white part is zero. And then evolve this observable. Well, for instance, actually, for the moment, actually, let put a, let's put a large box in there, and let's look at the evolution of F. I mean, if the dynamics is such that um, in finite time, you, a point cannot jump more than a fixed quantity, then, you know, after, let's say, one second, this is going to be that way, at time two, it's going to be like that. Certainly, it's going to stay gray in a half plane here, and it's going to stay white in half plane there. And it's only going to mix along, it's in a fat region along the y-axis, which means, actually, that both this observable and this observable on a half plane to the right are both uh, one, and here they're both zero. So you, if you actually go and measure the, um, and calculate the infinite volume measure, the infinite volume average, given that this uh, fat tube around the y-axis won't count in the limit, then, you know, this is going to be zero and one, and so the average is going to be one half, which is different from the product of the two averages. So this, this observable will tell you, well, your system is not mixing, but it's really, it is really mixing, it's the observable that is wrong in somehow. Because the observable, after all, is constant, let's say, not everywhere, but it's constant up to, you know, lower dimensional or, let's say, fat lower dimensional uh, manifolds. And then somehow those, those lower dimensional manifolds, you know, are an obstacle for you, but an obstacle that you, you wouldn't want to have. So what is the solution? One perfectly legitimate solution is, well, since it's up to you to define your, your class of global observable G, eliminate all these bad observables. Just cherry pick them and eliminate them. If you can, because that could be a very tedious job. Or a better solution in my case, for instance, in my opinion, especially for that case that I showed you, modify your uh, exhaustive family, so the class of large boxes. For instance, suppose we took that example, the random walk example, which was actually translation invariant, it was Z2 invariant. So basically, it did the same thing all over the phase space. I mean, if you translated that, that system, you, you, you will get, well, if the translation is Z2, you get the same system. If the translation is something different than Z2, you get something very close to that. So it doesn't make sense to choose boxes that are centered at the origin. I mean, the origin plays no special role. It's you that fix the origin there, but there is no reason. So it would be much more sensible to actually choose any box, any large box, any large square. And if you do that, then you, you start with the same observable. So here it's one, here it's zero. And then you took a very large box, very much to the left part of the plane, and this measures zero. The average of this is zero. But if you move the same large box here, this measures one. So there is no way that you can have that these, when you enlarge these boxes, you can go to one half 
if you want this to be uniform in the position of the box and only depend on the size of the box. So the better choice of V already eliminates that observable F from your class of observables because the infinite volume average of this doesn't exist uniformly, and you want it to be uniform. And this makes sense because, like I said, why should we choose boxes that are centered in the origin? What's wrong with boxes that are here? Okay? So this is to make the point that all the definitions that I've given and that I will give now, and I think actually I'm coming to a part of the talk that for me is even more interesting, especially in this audience, because it's more in the line of what most people in this audience actually do. So all these definitions really depend on the choice of V and G. So depends on what you mean by a large box, so what you mean by a large portion of the phase space, and what you want to measure there. Okay? And this is exactly where uh, you know, I can agree with uh, John Aronson. I mean, these, these are not universal definitions. I mean, you have to choose something. But if you choose something reasonably, then this can be made into perfectly good and rigorous definitions that can even be proved true at times. OK. But beyond global global mixing, I call these two definitions global global mixing because they are about the coupling of two global observables. Well, there is some shortcomings. There are some shortcomings in the global global mixing because, well, first of all, global global mixing absolutely does not see any finite measure phenomenon. For instance, you could have a system which is not even ergodic because there is a finite measure invariant set. And then global global mixing doesn't even see it because when you do an infinite volume average of a global observable, you wash out everything that is local. Secondly, more importantly, it doesn't really consider the evolution of an, of an initial probability measure, or sometimes physicists call it initial state, initial statistical state. So uh, the point of view of most people, and including myself, most of the time in this room is you want to study the statistical properties of dynamical systems. So you want to, you start with an initial measure, you want to call it, I don't know, you call it something, and then you want to see if it, how it evolves and if it reaches an equilibrium, what does it do? Okay, so global global mixing does not consider local uh, observables, so does not consider density, so does not consider um, probability measure, initial probability measures. So you want to have something, some other players, and these other players are the local observables. Now, once again, I'm going to give a definition which is not axiomatic. I mean, you choose your own class. Um, I'm, only I'm only asking that this class be a subclass of L1. And actually, it turns out that in most examples, actually, L1 works very well. Um, you have to be much more careful with the global observables, which are the really delicate objects, than with the local observables. But sometimes, also, you may need to restrict this. For instance, I mean, what, which is something that people in ordinary ergodic theory and in studying statistical properties of systems you know, do not disagree about. I mean, you know, you do the restrictions all the time. Like, you take C alpha functions, you take Lipschitz, Lipschitz functions at time if you want to prove decay of correlations and things like this. So it's not a big restriction. Anyway, so now that you have both global and local observables, it seems that, once again, the most natural or reasonable thing to do is to couple them and then, if, well, if you multiply a global and a local observable, actually, specifically, the evolution of a global observables with the local observables, then this is in an infinity, this is in an L1, so this thing is integrable. You can actually measure it with the measure mu, and you want them to decouple. Well, decoupling them means you want to take here the infinite volume average of that times the measure of the other one. So that seems to be a very reasonable um, definition of what I would call global local mixing. And the interpretation in terms of the statistical properties of dynamical systems is precisely that. I mean, suppose that you don't just choose any G. You choose a G that is a density. It belongs to your class L, but also it's positive and uh, integrates to 1, so it's normalized. And then you call mu G the measure whose density with respect to mu is G itself. And you see, the previous definition had this thing, which is really, I mean, you can you know, um, take the dual of that, and you can push forward the density or push forward if you wish the measure. So this tells you that the push forward the measure has a certain limit, which is something that we are used to do in our business. Only 
Now, the limit cannot be a probability measure because you have an invariant measure which is infinite, so you have too much space. And of course, the measure is going to be diluted all over the place. But if you take this limit to be some, some sort of, of a weak convergence over the right test functions, and the right test functions will be the global observables, then you can say, well, these measures converge to this functional in a certain weak sense. So, and to me, like I said, this, this makes sense. For instance, uh, in the Lorentz gas example, in the random walk example, if you can actually put the initial measure somewhere, in the random walk you can put the initial measure on one unit square, so you forget where the position of the initial point is, which means you're specifically, in the case of a random walk, you know the initial site, you don't know the dynamics that is going to happen afterwards because you don't know the exact position on the initial unit square. So, but then you want to know statistical properties of the system. What you do is that you evolve this measure and then you let it measure things that are global, such as the displacement function that I told you before, which is a global observables. This is actually what people do in probability, for instance. And you can do the same for a, for a Lorentz gas. Um, it turns out, actually, it's useful to have a weaker definition. Uh, these two definitions, when translated, when taken back to uh, finite ergodic theory, will be the same, because there is no problem in subtracting or adding constants, which are local observables in finite measure theory. But in uh, infinite, infinite ergodic theory, they are not local observables, so these two definitions are different. And clearly, uh, this definition is weaker than that one. So you only restrict to local observables which, are, which have zero average. Once again, there's an interpretation for that. You can take two densities now, and then you, do, you take the push forward of these two measures, or if you wish, you take the transfer operator, apply the two densities, and you don't know whether any of these, either of these converges, but you know that actually if they do converge, they converge to the same thing. In any case, they measure the same things. So I kind of came up with a fancy name for that. You say that the measures are asymptotically coalescing, which I mean they couple basically in a sense. As a matter of fact, even in finite measure cases, um, proving this is usually the bulk of proving statistical properties of dynamical system. And then in that case, you're lucky enough, one of these two measures can be taken to be the invariant measure already, or the SRB measure, or whatever measure you have. And so you can say that all the other measures converge to that one. Now you cannot say that because your infinite measure, which is not a measure, does not belong in this class. But, you know, it does say something. And then you have, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, this is important for other reasons. You, you can also come up with a uniform definition of this global local, global local mixing. You want this convergence to happen uniformly in a certain class or subclass of local observables. Now, this definition is uh, homogeneous with respect to multiplication of lo the local observables. So you want to normalize with something of the sort. Otherwise, this convergence could never be uh, uniform. And so you decide to normalize by the norm of the local observable. Why do you come up with that? Because there is something that comes out of that might not be so important for this talk. So some general results about this whole framework is that, well, there's clearly a hierarchy of definitions of global, global, mi global local mixing, um, which you could see before, so this is actually trivial. And it's not really hard to prove that of the two global, global mixing definitions that I've given you, the second one, which was the, the one that was mathematically more coherent, is in a sense stronger than the first one if you don't have that problem that I told you before. So if, in addition, you also know that infinite volume averages exist anyway, then this definition is stronger than that definition. Um, this is actually more recent work. This is actually a very easy proposition to prove. Um, exactness of an uh, infinite measure dynamical system, exactness is one property of a dynamical system that, that can be rewritten equally as well in finite and infinite ergodic theory. Well, and it gives you the idea that a system is strongly mixing. Well, this implies at least GLM1, so at least this asymptotically coalescent uh, property. And then you have an, an analogous result for automorphisms for K-mixing. Um, that is a little more complicated to describe, so I'll skip it here. Um, I think actually 
I, I don't know if I want to comment this. Um, this is the reason why um, someone might want to come up with that uniform definition of global, lo global local mixing. Um, this, seems, this proposition seems complicated, but it really tells you something that, something that is actually very simple. If you have some global local mixing property and you want to prove global global mixing, well, if you, if you have strong global local mixing property, meaning if you have convergence that is uniform in the global observable, then you can think of two global observables in this way. One, let's call it F, is there, stays there, and it evolves, and, and so on and so forth. And the other observable that you call G, you can think of, if you can, if you're in a right framework to do so, you can think of chopping G into the sum of um, local observables that have uh, disjoint supports, for instance. I mean, you can take, I don't know, let's say for the, in the case of expanding maps from R to R, one of my favorite examples is sine function. That's so it's one very good prototypical example of a global observable. Then, you know, you can, you can split the sine function into some of these observables, this plus that plus that, and so on and so forth. So you can actually think that you have a sum of local observables of this joint support. Then, of course, if these local observables mix uniformly well, and there are systems like the one that I've showed you, in which everything happens at the same rate, and you know, everything is of the same type throughout the phase space, there's no reason to, to believe that they don't mix with the same property. Then global, local, global, global mixing is just an average of this global local mixing. So you, you let tons of local observables mix up with the global observable, and then you average this, and so, but you need some technical condition which are precisely your, your um, well, condition GLM3, and then you actually get the strongest, if you wish, of the two forms of global global mixing. This was the reason for that. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that, anyway. Anyway, so this is the, the, the part of the talk where I actually present results. I mean, I'm not gonna give you ideas for the proof or anything at this, but you know, some math has been done, actually. Um, so for the random walk, you can actually prove all types of mixings, all five types, uh, depending on different choices. I mean, for instance, for you have to be careful with uh, um, uniform type of global local mixing. You want, you want to restrict your class to have some uniformity. It's very clear that you, you can always destroy the, the convergence rate if you take observables that are not very regular. So there are classes for which each of the five definitions are verified. For instance, for let's say for the, okay, let me forget about GLM3, which is the uniform one, which is more complicated to describe. Um, in, uh, for the other ones, it's uh, actually, okay. Local, local observables are always L1. Anything in L1 works. Global observables are functions that, um, I think I do have the time to describe it, so. Take one unit square and take the initial partition into um, the jump function. Uh, then you refine it with the second jump, so you have 16, let's say, rectangles. And then you also refine it since the, my choice was for that to be an invertible uh, map, so you refine it with the same thing in the past. Okay, and then you call BM, let's say, if, if you have M refinements in the future and the Mth refinement in the past, you call BM the sigma algebra generated by, by uh, the constants on these on, on this, uh, little rectangles. Well, then your choice of global observable is this. Um, So you take the union of, of um, the, sorry, the union, yeah, the union of this and the closure of the union. So 
um, function that can be approximated by locally constant functions, locally in this respect, and that have an average. So why do I have to have that complicated definition? I have to have it because, once again, this is an infinite measure space, so I have an infinite amount of space where things can go wrong. So you have, I mean, having these approximations is something very standard in, in uh, you know, decay of correlation business in statistical property business. But in my case, I have an infinite measure, so I cannot just say L infinity. Because if I say L infinity, it could be that L infinity can be approximated rather well in a square and then worse and worse and worse in other squares that go to infinity. So you need this approximation to be uniform throughout the infinite measure space. So you have to do something like this. But this class contains C alpha with all exponents alpha and everything like this. The point here, when you approximate, which is, which is the usual business, when you approximate your global observables with constant functions, you, ha you have to make sure that this approximation is uniform throughout the phase space. When you have a finite measure phase space, you don't have that problem because it always comes out uniform. But if you only ask for L infinity, which is what I would want to do, um, then it wouldn't work that way. What about topological mixing? Yes. Yes. Well, I really, it really depends on the system. You have, it has to do with the choice of V that you can use. I mean, I'll, I'll show you in a second. I mean, it, in this case, as I told you before, it makes sense to choose V since the system is, is um, invariant, translation invariant, it makes sense to choose V tra translation invariant. In other cases, it doesn't. And the choice of V is where the topology and everything related to the topology actually uh, goes into. So in a sense, I'm, I stay within the confines of ergodic theory, you know, if you remember the discussion that I, that I um, put forth in the beginning, because I don't talk about topology. But in another, in another sense, topology is actually you know, hidden in the choice of V. And really depends on, on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, you can do this for symbolic, symbolic dynamics and things like this, for instance. You can do this for uh, infinite state mark of chains. And so what do you do there? You can define topological mixing because you can define a topology, but then what does it mean to go to infinity? What does it mean to take a large box? You have to make choices. Okay. So, um, so here, I basically can prove everything, you know, if I'm careful enough to choose the right classes. In this case, I mean, well, it's easy to prove that um, all maps like this, even non-translational uh, invariant, are exact. And then if you have exact, you have the um, weakest form of global local mixing. But um, for quasi-lifts, so for periodic, if you wish, uh, maps, you can actually prove also the, the more regular, the more natural um, definition of global local mixing, which is GLM2. And GLM3, you have to be a little more careful. Once again, let me not discuss that. Um, and also here you can prove global global mixing. For instance, in this case though, which is the last case, uh, you can prove, uh, once again, you have exactness because have, I mean, it's known that the Ferry map is exact. So you can prove GLM1, the weakest form. You can actually prove um, for some cases, like Ferry, you can actually prove the other one. Um, I haven't thought about GLM3, but certainly, for instance, in this case, global global mixing does not and cannot hold. And this is pretty clear because here the mixing occurs only at infinity, if you wish. Uh, only, not at infinity, only in a finite bulk of the phase space. But there's, on the rest, the map is very close to the identity, which is the same as to say, most of the measure is concentrated here, where the map doesn't mix very well. So, um, and you cannot expect to be global global mixing because at any given time, you have mixed a lot in a finite part of the phase space and you haven't done anything in an infinite part of the phase space. So since you average with the measure, so you haven't done anything on most of your phase space, so you haven't mixed at all. So here you don't have and you shouldn't have um, infinite um, global, global global mixing. So the, the whole map? What? The whole map? 
Not, yeah, okay, the bull map, yes. Yes. The bull map, yes. You can, I don't, I don't know much about the bull map. I mean, I know I can prove something about the bull map. I can prove that the class of global observable is not trivial, but I cannot prove this quantity. And I think actually, these are, this is very recent result, by the way. So, and I think with these methods, I think the bull map is attackable as well. By the way, before I, um, I stop, maybe actually, well, let me just say something. I cheated you here because this example is actually is not mixing and cannot be mixing. Um, you have mixing only when you have, you know, when you choose your random walk carefully enough. This, this is, let's say, well, not, it's not exactly the simple symmetric uh, random walk, but it's something very similar. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, nearest neighbor random walk. And if you agree with me, this cannot be mixing and should not be mixing because the random walk is not, um, is irreducible, but is not aperiodic. So if you color your sites here with, let's say, black and black and black and white and white and white, like a checkerboard, then if you start with white, you always jump to white sites at even times and black sites at odd times. So you cannot be mixing, you shouldn't be mixing. Now, if you don't have that problem, if you, if you choose your random walk to be, as they say in the business, strongly aperiodic, so irreducible and aperiodic, then you have all these properties. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much.